Ozzy Osbourne has been at the forefront of metal since its inception. A founding member of Black Sabbath, Osbourne helped transform the world of hard rock music into what would later be understood as heavy metal. However, by the end of the 70s, Osbourne had been ejected from the band and was struggling to chart a path forward. Enter Sharon Arden, who recruited his new bandmates, including the incomparable Randy Rhodes. Together they wrote and recorded the song and album which would kick off Osborne's incredible and long-lasting solo career, Crazy Train, on the album Blizzard of Oz. Hello there, it's Warren Hewitt here. Hope you're doing marvellously well. Welcome back to another episode of the series, and if you haven't already, please subscribe. If you hit the notification bell, you'll be notified when we have a new video. And if you're into production, you can go to producelikeapro.com and sign up for the email list and get a whole bunch of free goodies. In April of 1979, Ozzy Osbourne was ejected from the band that he helped form, Black Sabbath and he found himself in a downward spiral. He recalled to Classic Rock magazine in 2002, I got 96,000 pounds for my share of the name. So I just locked myself away and spent three months doing coke and booze. My thinking was, this is my last party because after this I'm going back to Birmingham and the doll. It was Sharon Arden who helped Osborne back onto his feet and the pair would get married three years later. Her family was also managing Sabbath at the time, and when it became clear that they wouldn't accept Osborne back, she quickly started putting together a new band for the dejected singer. The new band was called The Blizzards of Oz, and there was already one member that changed everything, guitarist Randy Rhodes. Sharon recalled in her autobiography, Randy completely blew Ozzy away. He was like a gift from God. He was nice and funny and a brilliant musician, and he had drive, and Ozzy and him connected so well, everything about him was perfect. Rhodes was young, but already an incredible guitarist. Before joining up with Osborne, he had been playing in the Los Angeles band Quiet Riot. Reflecting back after his premature death, Osborne told Mojo magazine he'd fall asleep holding his guitar. He played classical guitar. He would take lessons from local music teachers he looked up in the phone book while on tour. He even had dreamed of going to school for a degree in classical guitar to record his own solo album. As a guitarist, the man was a force of nature, but for Osborne, he was also the person who Osborne felt the most comfortable writing music. Along with bassist Bob Daisley, Osborne and Rhodes began writing music together at a live-in studio in Monmouth, Wales. When I first met Ozzy, there was no band yet. So I was staying at his house, and he and I were just sort of knocking ideas around. And then we met Bob, and the three of us, while we were looking for a drummer auditioning, we were just sort of messing around with riffs and ideas. Together, the trio wrote many of the songs which would appear on their first album, Blizzard of Oz. Daisley told Song Facts that writing with Osborne and Rhodes was easy. It flowed well. When the band was first together, it really was just Ozzy and Randy and me, because we were writing the stuff and auditioning drummers at the same time. We didn't have Lee. Writing with Ozzy was fairly easy because we had a little songwriting machine going. Randy and I would work on music together, just sitting on chairs opposite each other, and then we'd put parts together, and then we'd knock it off, and Ozzy would sing a melody over it. Rhodes had been credited with inspiring many of the album's most famous tracks through his creativity coming from his inventive guitar riffs. All right, guys, this is Max Carlisle from the Guitar Max channel. We've got the Randy Rhodes guitar, we've got the Zach Wild cab, and we're going to check out some awesome Blizzard of Oz era Randy Rhodes riffs and talk about how important Randy Rhodes was for all heavy metal music going forward, not in just the 80s. But first, let's look at a really important riff. This is a riff from the first track off of uh, Blizzard of Oz, I Don't Know. Let's check this out, because there's something really important I want to talk about in a second here. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, so to us these days, that might seem like a simple riff, but Randy is doing something really, really important there that you're going to hear for the entire decade that comes after that. And what he's doing there is he's writing on the open A string, and then he's got these moving chords that go between the open string notes, right? So that happens there, and there's something really important here because if you listen to the bass part in that track, the bass does not follow those chords that the guitar is playing. The bass comes together with the guitar when he hits that big open G chord, and it really just punches you in the face with that G. And the thing here is that this is kind of a big departure from the sort of 70s metal that came before. And right, I mean, Blizzard of Oz, this was Ozzy's first album on his own, right? And if you listen to some of the other tracks on Blizzard of Oz, like Mr. Crowley, right, that's more of a mid-tempo, kind of a slower track. And that one is much more along the lines of something you would hear on a Black Sabbath album with these big chords, right? <laughs> Right, just big power chords here, and that's Black Sabbath style stuff. And also, another key thing, that same thing with the guitar and the bass matching up. In Mr. Crowley, the bass and the guitar change together, but on the tracks like Crazy Train or I Don't Know, the bass and the guitar are much more independent, and they only come together when there's just going to be a huge change, a huge big chord in the song that really knocks you off your feet. Okay, and this just overall concept, right, of sort of using a drone note, right, where you have this open string, then you've got these moving chords in between. You hear that on so many metal songs. Everything from Dawkin to Metallica and even, you know, Judas Priest, Painkiller, right, like into the early 90s, so many metal songs used riffs like that. The thing here that's really important about this is this was the first Ozzy album, really, and you know, Randy Rhodes was writing these riffs, right? But even the guitar players that came after Randy Rhodes, they still used this sort of pattern. I don't want to say formula, right? But they still used ingredients like this in their songs. Like Jakey e. Lee is a great example. <laughs> Right there, okay? You've got one chord that's moving, and then you've got the open A string that goes in between those other chords. And same thing, again, the bass part doesn't follow those other chords. The bass part and the guitar part come together later on towards the end of the riff. <laughs> So that riff right there, possibly one of the most famous riffs in all of metal, not just Ozzy songs. And this one's really kind of cool because this is in the key of F sharp, right? But the rest, you know, a lot of the other parts of the song are in the key of A, right? So having a key change early on in the song, it kind of like, it separates the intro and the intro riff from the rest of the song. It almost makes that intro riff its own song like a prelude to the rest of the song coming up. Now right there, that's uh, sort of the second intro riff. It's also the verse riff in Crazy Train, right? And they're using that same concept, open A string with moving chords in between. You see that showing up again and again and again in Aussie songs. It's, I mean, it's an incredibly useful songwriting tool. So we're talking about this technique, right, of, uh, you know, having the open string in there and then the moving chords around. And yeah, Randy really pioneered that when it comes to Aussie's music. But something that I've always thought about is because you hear that technique showing up in so many uh, later songs written by other guitar players, in a way, when you hear stuff off the later albums, you're kind of still hearing Randy Rhodes in those songs. You're still hearing his influence. And I think as great as those guitar players are, Jakey e. Lee and Zach Wilde and Gus G, 
you know, as great as those guys are, they're still, I think, in some ways, standing on the shoulders of Randy Rhodes. And he was a little guy, but clearly he's been able to prop up a lot of people in the future, even though he's not with us anymore. Now, I got to say, as a guitar player, this guitar really lends itself well to playing these riffs. I mean, it gives you a sort of inspiration to come up with 80s sounding riffs, not just because I know about the history of it, but just, I don't know, something about the guitar and, you know, it, the guitar is heavy. It's got some serious weight to it. It's got a really focused mid-range sound to it. And uh, yeah, it just has a really beautiful sound. <laughs> Beautiful harmonics. Now, one thing I really notice about this guitar is it has a really big difference between the tone in the neck pickup and the bridge pickup. Now, part of that is because this guitar has 22 frets. Some of the modern Vs have 24 frets, but you lose something with that. When you get those two extra frets in there, you have to shift the neck pickup closer to the bridge pickup, and you lose a little bit of the difference in the sound. It doesn't sound quite as, quite as sweet, right? quite as warm. And when you listen to some of the solos, those early 80s uh, rock and metal solos, and especially the stuff that Randy played, I mean, he had such a wonderful tone, such, you know, a perfect, uh, just uh, foundational metal tone. And a big part of it has to do with that classic pickup placement. Now, personally, I love 24 fret guitars, but on a guitar like this, if I'm going to lose that magic tone, then I don't want to, I don't want those two extra frets. It's not worth it with Rhodes' incredible and virtuosity talents on display. The trio was able to write an album of incredible tracks, including Crazy Train, I Don't Know, Mr. Crowley, and Still Away the Night. Crazy Train was the album's first single release and really can be credited with kicking off Osborne's solo career. It too emerged from Randy's riff, Daisley told Song Facts. Randy had a basic riff, the signature riff, when we worked on music together. He needed something to solo on, so I came up with a chord pattern and a section for him to solo over. So here's that great bass line with the drums that Randy is soloing over. I love just how kind of clattering it is. There's those really super fast triplets. Obviously, along with Randy's incredible solo, Daisley's bass part is incredibly important. It's an iconic rhythmic drive. The various sections of the bass line keep the energetic push of the song moving forward. So let's just check out that bass line on its own again. I mean, what an incredible line, what an incredible groove to solo over. The song title came together as Daisley and Rhodes realized that the riff, along with Rhodes' experimentations of psychedelic sounding pedals, gave the impression of an unusual locomotive. Randy was into trains. He used to collect model trains and so did I. I've always been a train buff and so was Randy. So I said, Randy, that sounds like a train and it sounds nuts. And I said, a crazy train. 
With this inspiration in mind, Daisley wrote the lyrics and Osborne came up with a joyous melody. One of the truly powerful things that Osborne brings to his songs, whether it was with Black Sabbath or now on his own with Blizzard of Oz, is a bit of theatrics and of course his incredible personality. Let's check out Ozzy's vocals. Of course, the, the intro is iconic. The delay effect. I, 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 I. Go to the verse. Crazy, but that's how it goes. Millions of people living as foes. Maybe mental wounds. Everything about this, a hooky, simplistic melody, but super, super hooky, attitude. You know, Ozzy is a larger than life character. I mean, that's an understatement. Black Sabbath was for many people, the birth of heavy metal. You could argue about what bands came before or after, but they were enduring. They came out, the first album was really, really important. And then they carried on making incredible music for decades. And Ozzy was at the forefront of that band. He was the image for us. As kids, we knew all knew the story about him biting the head off a bat. We knew all of this stuff. And he seemed to be the personification of heavy metal. And yet he writes good, simplistic, hooky melodies that everybody can remember. Ozzy's vocal delivery is completely unique. Nobody sings or sounds like him. And I think it's a great juxtaposition between the darkness of this song, the darkness of Sabbath, that he would have this kind of really cold vocal. You know, coming from an industrial city, it really makes sense, hence heavy metal. And while most of the music was written before they had found a drummer, Lee Kerslake's playing certainly fits right into the sound of what Osborne, Rhodes and Daisley had been creating. Let's check out the drum part. iconic guitar part bleeding into the drums real musicians playing together four on the floor it's the late 70s disco is getting in everywhere that drive is amazing now let's listen to Randy's incredible riff. This is just such a great guitar riff. When I was a kid, I don't know a guitar player that couldn't play this. Everything about that, the drive, just that really fast syncopated part, the fact that he's throwing in some great guitar riffs in between, the -la -la -la, just a guitar player's dream. When you're a kid, this is what you want to learn. You want to learn a really cool riff like this. You want to learn how to drive the song. You want all those riff fills and everything. Great guitar riff. So let's listen to I Don't Know. Here is the really amazing guitar part. I just love how he just throw in like this crazy riff in the middle of all of the chugging and everything. Steal Away the Night. Great song. Again, start with Randy's guitar.
is quite unique and something that we forget that bands in those days wanted it to sound like they're in a studio recording live, like the best possible take. And that's what you get. That's what you get with artists like this. That's what you get with Ozzy and his band. You get a band in a room performing and just ripping and making it feel like the best live recording you've ever heard. Now, Mr. Crowley is obviously, it's one of the most important songs that Ozzy has ever done. And, you know, the association with the occult obviously is pretty huge and Alistair Crowley. So, you know, it's not surprising that this is one of, even to this day, one of his most popular, if not along with Crazy Train, the most popular song he ever did. Almost church organy, you know, which is, there's nothing more scary than the idea of like a church at night, organ playing, you know, gravestones, you know, you get it. So it's fantastic, sort of detuned and very, very mysterious. I mean, what a triumph coming from one of the best metal bands, best hard rock bands of all time, Black Sabbath, and then putting this out as your debut album. I mean, what an incredible thing. I mean, my hat's off to Ozzy for being able to pull himself out of leaving that incredible band and then being able to create this insanely good solo album. And obviously with Randy, um, you know, as a writer and Bob Daisley as well, I mean, those guys really brought the A game. And what a band, what a phenomenal band. You know, Sharon, soon to be Sharon Osbourne, obviously is a huge part of this. And I love that. Don't, doesn't anybody love that? You know, that's kind of a love story, getting it together. Like it's the Phoenix rising from the ashes. It's pretty amazing. Got to go to the outro of Mr. Crowley, obviously. And let's just listen to soloed Randy, the guitar playing here again, I suppose neoclassical people say, but whatever you want to call it, a very heavy classical influence. super and like Eddie that ability to just step outside of the scale just do a chromatic kind of better do better better just something that's a little wrong it's a little middle finger it's a little rock and roll a little you know just edgy and different along with this really perfectly written you know melodic piece that works over the chord sequence absolutely superb and why Randy Rhodes is still regarded as one of the most influential guitar players of all time. Now this is commonplace. Pretty much every band now has guitar players that choreograph their guitar solos perfectly. But in those days, it was a rare thing. And to this kind of level and with his classical kind of influences that Randy brought, it really was the birth of this style. It was not to say other people weren't doing it, but really this became center stage. A hugely successful album with a young, like long blonde hair, shredding guitar player, just like everything we wanted as kids. Absolutely superb. The Blizzard of Oz album was recorded at Ridge Farm Studios, one of England's first residential recording studios located near the Surrey Sussex border. Chris Tangaridis was brought in to produce the album, but studio engineer Max Norman ended up stepping into the role after the band weren't pleased with Tangaridis' work and fired him. Norman recalled, I was just the resident studio engineer. We had just built that room and put in a new solid state logic board. It was the second one in England. At that time, it was a big deal. I didn't want Blizzard to sound like crap, but it didn't sound too good with Chris at the start. The band were looking a little glum. When Chris would leave the control room, I would replay the tape in the headphones and rebalance the mix to make it sound decent. 
Then Ozzy fired him and called me and asked me if I wanted to do the record. And I said, sure. That's how I ended up producing and engineering that record and the next four. The album was basically recorded live with all four band members playing in the same room. Rhodes would triple track his solos in spite of how complicated they often were. Once he'd figured out how he wanted the solo to go, he would amazingly replicate it note for note with no problems. The group's first single, Crazy Train, from the album was released a few days before the album itself, and it was billed, as expected, to the band as the Blizzard of Oz, with Ozzy Osbourne's name included in smaller print. However, when the intended self-titled album Blizzard of Oz was released, Osbourne's name was the largest print, given the effect of it being an Ozzy Osbourne solo record, with Blizzard of Oz as simply a title. This was largely how history remembers the album, Ozzy Osbourne's first solo record, but one with an incredible cast of musicians. The Blizzard of Oz album was a commercial success. By 1997, it had been certified four times platinum. As a single, Crazy Train peaked in 1981 at number nine on Billboard's hot mainstream rock airplay chart. It launched Osborne's solo career, but it was perhaps best remembered for introducing the world to the talents of Randy Rose, who would die tragically young in a plane crash only a few years later. I don't know what to say. Randy Rhodes, Ozzy Osbourne. I'm a huge Black Sabbath fan. The first album is one of my favorite records. I'm sure you've heard me say that many, many times. I believe the first Black Sabbath record to be one of the most important rock albums ever made. You guys can disagree with me, but it's incredible. That album was, was made in less than two days, start to finish. So here we have one of the most important rock bands of all time, the singer and the band part ways. Ozzy's not sure how he's gonna continue. Like you said, he thinks he's gonna go back on the dole and that's it, it's all over for him. And Sharon steps in. That's Black Sabbath's manager's daughter, steps in, rises him up from the gutter, the phoenix rising from the ashes as it were, and they make this incredible record. And Randy Rhodes helps define a whole genre of guitar playing. Now, it's not to say people, like I said earlier, didn't incorporate classical into their playing. Of course they did. Richie Blackmore, famously so. And I'm a huge Richie Blackmore fan. But Randy put it front and center. You had Eddie on one side and you had Randy on the other. And those two coming together, for every kid guitar player I knew, those were the two guitar players that were name checked. There are many, many other amazing guitar players, but those two in hard rock and metal were the guys that everybody seemed to aspire to, with very good reason. Incredibly creative guitar solos from Randy, incredibly creative guitar parts, hooks, and Crazy Train to this day still remains one of the most covered guitar playing songs ever. If you go and see a metal band play, especially if they're playing classic, what's now regarded as classic rock, they'll do a Crazy Train cover. I'm still to this day, if I walk into a guitar center in Hollywood, somebody at some point in the day is going to be sitting there going, doo, 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 doo. it's just a staple. It's Stairway to Heaven, it's Crazy Train, it's Smoke on the Water. Those are the guitar parts that so many of us learn. Randy, you'll be sorely missed. Ozzy, we love you. Sabbath, solo, absolutely amazing. Without a doubt, one of the most important heavy rock singers, songwriters, of all time. What an incredible solo record. What a way to start off a solo career. It was great. It was really, really great. I hope you enjoyed that. Please have any comments and questions below. Um, thank you ever so much for watching. Give us any ideas of what else you'd like to see. Um, thanks ever so much and uh, so long, farewell. Au revoir, au revoir. Adios, ciao, uh, dos vidania, tutsins, alvidazan, tschüss, goodbye. Adios, adios.